Eyes on Whiteness is a podcast that illuminates the insidious and ignorant ways of whiteness, regardless of intent. Our guests are invited to talk about the ways white supremacy and patriarchy are pervasive and ever-present. Our conversations are rooted in a commitment to normalizing the how, not if, lens for looking at the ways it's present for all of us. If you'd like to support us, we'd greatly appreciate it. You can find us on Patreon, Eyes on Whiteness. I'm your host, Maureen Benson, and sometimes I'll be joined by Deidre Barber, who will only show up when she feels like it. The podcast is produced by the brilliant and kind Aaron Rand Freeman. We're excited to welcome you to the show. Suk Zucker is a Korean-American cisgender grateful wife and mother, daughter and sister who loves to cook and spend time with her friends and family. A dedicated social justice advocate and racial equity leader, Unsuk's almost 20 years in the field of education includes roles as teaching elementary school in various states, a facilitator of courageous conversations about race, a teacher leader, teacher leadership coordinator and school improvement partner for Denver Public Schools, She's been a senior manager and director of diversity, equity, and inclusion and national seed project staff member. Unsa holds various degrees from academia, but also, in my eyes, holds a million degrees of lessons in the way of life. Unsa is my shiro. She's an amazing advocate, partner, and parent focused on equity and justice, not only around her, but also with a relentless commitment to doing the work within herself. I have learned so much about honoring multitudes of experiences and holding accountability rooted in love from Unsuk. I'm honored to be in relationship with her and excited to get to share this conversation with you all. Please welcome Unsuk Zucker. So just for the purposes of um, introductions and knowing who you are what feels really who are you and what feels really important to share with anyone who's listening to my sister on eyes on whiteness yeah my name is Unsa Zucker I identify as a Korean American um cisgender female uh pronouns are she her and hers um I would say today in this moment uh who I am is uh a temp to do what I can to be a social justice warrior and parent and partner in life. And I say that because not only are we in this pandemic world where that's literally who I get to hang out with and see every day, um, but to be the parent of a biracial son who very much outwardly presents as Asian, um, we lovingly reference him as our rainbow unicorn sparkle boy um, not only has it been a journey in parenting um, as a, a boy of color, but um, to have a son who loves all things rainbow, unicorn, sparkles, um, to find the balance in instilling in him the confidence and unapologetic, uh, unapologetically love all of who he is, while preparing him for all the ways in, my, in which he might be reacted towards or um, received has been a whole new sense of why I do the work that I do, whether it's at home or in the workplace. Um, So I'd say that's who I am. I really appreciate the abundance of identity (laughs) that you bring into that, into who you are. It's one of the many things I love about you is that you um, my experience with you, Unsuk, has been that you just really bring such a brilliant, nuanced um, series of lenses to all conversations, and it's and and that and the fullest of who you are into all of that. And so, thank you for being exactly who you are. I really appreciate you. <laughs> um, so, you talked about a few things here, which I think, and you and I have been talking in kind of preparation for this podcast today of, you know, there's your identity as someone who is engaged in equity work, um, in education and beyond, and then you're also a parent of a young boy of color, rainbow unicorn sparkle boy, 
<laughs> and that is who he is. Like that is such a great description <laughs> of him. Oh, I love him so much. Um, and I, you know, part of the reason we started doing uh, these podcasts in this time is it's funny in Eyes on Whiteness, we were planning this whole season of a particular investigative journalism piece, and it's not done yet. And one of the conversations those of us who were producing it were having was, you know, what does it look like to just get, get it out there before it's done, quote unquote, you know? Um, and so hence the idea of just talking to people, particularly folks who have a level of racial consciousness or at least around culture of whiteness, um, and how that's, ha you know, what's going on in the time of this pandemic and the time of a global pandemic where I feel like everything is being magnified. And so kind of in these two identities, you can vacillate, you don't have to pick one or the other, whatever speaks to you. But in your two, you know, in two of these primary identities that you named, um, what are you noticing about whiteness in the time of coronavirus? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> those two identities definitely are at, at this point um, inseparable. And what I mean is um, it's super humbling to see all the ways in which I have internalized, perpetuated, and or allowed whiteness to surface in my own life and have that surface um, in how my, how my son shows up. Um, and so when I look at the ways in which um, he has reacted to um, white supremacy culture of right to comfort even, and the ways in which he has already internalized by himself um, others' right to comfort over his own. Um, my first reaction is, is to get defensive on his behalf, to get angry. And then the second sort of stage of that is shame and guilt in the ways in which I have um, uh, exemplified that for him in the ways in which I have shown up. And so it's sort of this like circular, um, he teaches me every day as much as I teach him, if not more, because the ways in which I have seen him internalize others' right to comfort, I'm forced to reflect on what are the ways in which I've modeled that for him. But that also means the ways in which I teach him to disrupt that are the ways in which I take that then and disrupt it for myself. And so it's sort of this circular, um, cyclical sort of um, process that happens in our house. Mm. I, I, it really resonates when, you know, we identify something, a way in which I, uh, so it resonated with me, a way in which I can see that I'm perpetuating whiteness, the, the wave of shame that really spoke to me. And I can't even imagine, I don't have any biological children, so I can't even imagine how much that that's magnified. Can you talk a little bit about an example of um, one, a, a way in which um, you either reflected on something that he saw you do where you weren't disrupting um, and or a way in which you're attempting to model for him disrupting someone's right to comfort, particularly for the sake of justice or racial equity? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's one particular, like the most poignant moment for me was um, <clears throat> there's a day about a year ago, uh, my son came home and had shared with us an incident. Um, then another boy had pulled up his eyes, you know, and started speaking gibberish at him. He sobbing, crying because he had clearly held it in all day. And when we asked with the, the, the school staff, um, how the school staff responded. Um, his his sort of playback was, the adults said it wasn't okay. They turned to him and said, "Stop, racist, don't do that again. He said, sorry, and it's over now. I think I'll be okay. And so we said, mm, okay. Um, but do you understand what's hurting right now? Like, do you understand how you were hurt? Do you understand what is hurting internally? And do you think this other boy understands how he impacted you? Like, do you think he understands why that was racist or why that was inappropriate? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so um, 
we took it upon ourselves to go back to school, have a conversation between them. And when we came back, Colton was um, crying again. And so when we said, is this still bothering you? He said, no, um, I just feel really bad that he feels bad. So that was my mirror of, oh, you're more upset at causing his discomfort than you are at the harm that was done. And I said, well, why, why is that bothering you? And he said, well, I just know people at work um, don't always treat you right either. Um, but I see you always trying to find uh, ways around it. And I went, Ooh. <laughs> and so, um, the, my, I, I don't know if it was defensive. I don't know if I just went straight to an intellectual place, but my brain immediately went to, Oh, he's, he's, you know, a little kid. He doesn't understand expectations of professionalism. He doesn't understand how to motivate and influence adults. He doesn't understand. I just went into all these different spaces. All the rationalization rooted in white. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And and the reality is, as I started to do that, I had to hit pause and one, ask myself, what would I be saying if he were to say the same thing to me about what it means to be a student, a good student? What are the messages we can send to kids every day about what it means to be a good student? And what are the ways in which by doing that, I'm perpetuating that very same, you know, behavior? What are the ways, um, if I'm going to sit here and say that DEI equity work is the work that I do, and yet I model that even for my own coworkers. Am I really doing the work? Am I really, um, you know, um, I have colleagues who like to say there's a difference between course correction and disruption. And am I constantly choosing course correction without disruption? And if that's the case, I'm going to be doing a whole lot of course corrections because I'm not actually disrupting the root cause of that. Um, so I don't know if that's actually what you were asking, but that's what came to mind. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, so I mean, that's one, I, I appreciate that um, you were able to be introspective in the look of the ways of which, whether it was defensiveness or intellectualizing it, the, the ways in which you chalked it up to, oh, he doesn't understand professionalism, right? Like that's super powerful because what is professionalism if not white supremacy culture, right? And so right. In fact, he does understand, hey, <laughs> you're asking me to do this thing. And I think the other thing I really appreciate is um, so much that you are modeling for him that there's an opportunity to have um, discourse, but even in, in a space of disagree where, you know, you can, he can, he can say that to you and he can say that without, I mean, I don't know what the experience is like for him, but fear is not stopping him from saying that to you maybe you know right and so that's yes. beautiful and it and it's a way of what, what stands out for me around that is that so often in whiteness and in patriarchy we have hierarchy right and you don't dare challenge those that have power over and i think you're doing a really beautiful job in that beginning that wonderful beginning that is that story um even though it's sad to, to what started it is you're creating like a power with, you know, where you're empowering each other and you can hold some mirrors up. So yeah, I think it answered the question. And I, I'm curious, cause I know now, like we've been chatting the last few weeks that something has happened uh, with his schooling. And so I would imagine that was one of several seeds where you were dissatisfied with at least the staff's ability to hold that space, have there be authentic amends and un unpacking of, of what's going on there. Um, and so I know something happened recently uh, in this time of coronavirus that maybe was a straw for you and I think gave you a wonderful opportunity to go ahead and do some disrupting. Do you want to tell a little bit about what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll preface with um, it, uh, in retrospect, it absolutely felt like something to be disrupted and um, what I wish I would have done was to lay some groundwork around why this particular incident was so incredibly deeply harmful. So in the age of coronavirus, um, to be very visibly East Asian presenting, both myself and my son, we live in a world where um, <clears throat> we back a beautiful open space with hiking trails. Um, we live in, in suburbs where I am used to going to the grocery store 
uh, my son is used to coming with me. Um, and we live in a day and age now where none of those activities that I just named that in theory would, would bring peace and comfort actually instill a deep sense of fear um, and anxiety because um, while I am deeply grateful that nobody has said or done anything directly to us, we have been the recipient of enough looks and sneers um, to see people visibly see us in a grocery aisle, avoid it, go to another aisle, wait for us to leave. Um, that the current state of um, our president and the messaging that um, certain leaders have chosen to perpetuate put us in a place where um, to leave my house needs to be physically and psychologically unsafe. So we'll preface that. Um, and to have to, to share with my 10 year old son, yes, we're on a walk. Yes, you're used to going down a parallel path and meeting up to us. And now, no, you're not actually safe. No, you can't actually do that. Um, super humbling. And so just wanna make sure that I, I sort of name the situation and where our hearts are. And so in the midst of this situation, um, I happened to uh, fall upon um, a public Facebook page um, of my son's school leader. They're having a virtual happy hour, um, super excited, thought it was super funny to celebrate a virtual Zoom happy hour. That in and of itself, great. Glad you're connecting with your family. The part that made my stomach sink was it was some sort of hashtag cowboy theme. And for whatever reason, this leader um, and their spouse decided that um, associated with, with um, cowboy theme would be a fake MAGA hat. And um, not only did they post a very proud, um, excited picture about celebrating um, their family's virtual happy hour with a fake MAGA hat, um, my son's own classroom teacher then responded and said, ha ha ha, I love the MAGA hat. So there are multiple layers here of adults who interact with my son. Um, I saw the post, I saw the interaction, and it, uh, was beside myself. I didn't know what to do because sitting where we sit, um, we are part of the community. We know just on our street alone, there are several other families who look just like us, who are feeling the exact same way. And I thought it was important for the leader to understand that from a white female perspective, there is an incredible amount of privilege in thinking anything associated with a MAGA hat is funny. Um, because for us, that MAGA hat represents deep, deep hurt. Um, it represents um, physical, psychological harm um, to a community that she says she's committed to serving. And so um, at first I sort of decided to post uh, more sort of anonymously around your white leader. This, this is not funny. This actually is causing harm. Um, and in the background, um, my son had seen some of this in the background because I had my computer open and lo and behold that evening found him sobbing. And when we asked him um, what he was upset about, he said, um, he had, we had had some struggles over the last couple of years because of leadership challenges. And he said, I've spent this whole year trying to rebuild trust with the adults in my school. And I feel like all that hard work and all that trust is gone now. And I don't even know what to do anymore. Oh. Mm. I'm so sorry. That had to have been one of the hardest things to hear um, when I just had such deep respect for my 10 year old son to be able to articulate it that way. Um, and that only made the situation more painful for me as a parent um, and more enraging um, as somebody who <laughs> It's in this work as somebody who has offered to support the school, has offered to support um, the community. 
uh, and you know, um, I think one of the things that I have really struggled to wrap my arms around is as a parent still feeling gaslighted. So um, raising the situation, raising the concern with, with district leadership around why this is harmful, why this is hurtful, and to be met with um, responses like, I think this was just a lapse in judgment, um, to be met with a, a, a list of trainings and support that this leader has gotten, um, and the fact that I actually had to point out that that is true. Don't deny or question that those things are true. And because those things are true, this decision actually is more disappointing than had those things not been true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so for me, it, it, it became the super frustrating um, round and round and round conversation um, in me and, and many, many folks from across the country um, calling out the leader and the school district in, yes, this leader, what, what this leader did was extremely hurtful. And it is a, a symptom. <laughs> it is um, a reflection of deeper seated systemic issues that haven't been disrupted, that haven't been confronted. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's where um, it feels like the age old challenge in the equity work that we do, that uh, an individual act of bigotry um, gets sort of focused on versus the actual systemic challenges that led to the, the space for this individual act of bigotry to occur. Mm. Right, in that, like, what is the failure of the system to um, have people be accountable for the extensive development that they've gone through, right? I appreciate your naming the, the, the list of development that this person has gone through makes this more egregious, right? That, that, that we're not actually internalizing this work, but we're checklisting the work. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, that, you know, it's, you said something too at the beginning, so I'm curious um, to unpack this a little bit. You said uh, that if you had to do it differently, you might have laid some different groundwork. Um, and I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to that, because I think there's the, right, there's the disruption, and then there's the course correction. And I think, you know, our dear colleague and brother Cortland always taught me that uh, whiteness shows up as peace over truth. And when, you know, when I'm thinking about a school system, you know, we've both been involved in school systems for decades. When I think about the dysfunction of school systems, so much of that dysfunction actually means that um, attempting to course correct means incremental change, slow, incremental, painful change. And unfortunately, sometimes only the system responds to egregious disruption, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, as I heard you say, oh, if you had it to do differently. So I'm just curious a little bit more like, one, what would you have done differently? And two, how much of that is your assumption that, that you're responsible to hold the emotional labor of a system steep? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I go back and forth, and in transparency, the reason I say if I were to go back, it would have laid the groundwork um, is actually because I wish I would have um, made clear just how egregious egregious it was, um, because the reaction I was getting from district leaders led me to believe that they didn't quite understand the terror that our family has been operating within. Right. And so it was less about um, sort of softening the blow. It was actually about <laughs> sharpening the pain for them to understand. Word. Um, I will say, uh, I reached a new level of disappointment last week. And here's why. I joined um, an all call for an affinity group space last week, um, a a national all call for a a racial affinity space specifically focused on the Asian American perspective and the Latinx perspective. And I listened to um, Asian American leader of the same school district talk about his own as an Asian American, what it has meant to grow up 
with what he now understands as his own self-hatred because of the ways in which he wasn't white enough and the ways in which the current COVID situation has impacted him and his family. And to watch the same leaders who are essentially telling me that our experience in this situation with this leader is not worth calling out, not worth following up, not worth addressing, are, are reacting to this other person, same district, with, oh, that's so terrible, I feel so bad, that's, I can't believe it, we need to do more, asking for book resources. Um, uh, someone else had also asked for book titles, and so I put a book title in there and immediately uh, a school a district leader who has chosen not to get involved in my son's situation says, oh, what was that book title? I really want to know that book title. And all I could think was, of course, you, white leader, want to read a book about it as opposed to learning from the actual experiences and believing the people in your community who are telling you what this means, um, which sort of gets to another way whiteness shows up often in education is the intellectualized that we want to read books about it. We don't actually want to learn from um, pain. Not that we should have to learn or lean on people's pain, but when people surface it, um, the one thing I wish more than anything is that white people would just believe me. Right. <laughs> that's all I want. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that's interesting too, the, the ways in which what warrants believing. I mean, is it your personal like your personal emotional story or does it need to be academia you know in academia with an isbn number for it to be valid and i think that that's a way that whiteness shows up is like you know and i actually appreciate that so many people are writing articles that offer this counter narrative of what is the asian experience you know even though there's a variety of asian experiences but what are the asian experiences happening in this in the country right now and and if you need to read a book about it because you don't know or have relationship with folks that are going through it, then that's a point of reflection, right? That it would that folks in that affinity space could be galvanized to hear from someone's reaction, but it there wasn't. Well, I mean, I don't know, but like it seems absent of a personal accountability. It's all still over here, right? Here, I heard this person's story, and I have a relationship with that person, but that person's story didn't have anything to do with anything I caused harm. Ooh, now I'm interested and curious to go down the rabbit hole, as opposed to oh, something on my watch is causing harm to a child and a family that, that we love and that we respect. What do we need to do? And sometimes when we have that like I think about it all the time. Once what shifted for me as a white educator was to stop distancing myself from black and brown students who I loved very much and start thinking about them like my children. And it transformed how I showed up because I didn't have to have it all figured out. What I knew was you're gonna stop hurting my baby. <laughs> right. And I and and that right. in whiteness like wants us to just pause, figure out how we, you know what's the steps that we need to take? There's no binder to end racism. Like I don't have steps one through three, but it, what does it look like to not have to have a plan or something rooted and cited in academia, but just to be in action because someone believe you. So there's harm happening and we don't know what the answer is, but you know what we know? If somebody's hurting my baby, you're gonna stop and we're just gonna get at the table and figure it out. Yeah, you know, the uh, intellectualization and um, even the, the idea in academia and in the quote unquote professional field around uh, credibility, what is needed to build a sense of credibility has been something that I have thought a lot about lately. Um, <clears throat> and that example just sort of surfaced it all over again for me. Of, I personally respond to textbooky books as I, 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 my brain stays at policy, to your point. Um, uh, like, what are some of the checklisty? What is my base level um, um, actions that I have to take versus a personal investment in what I'm doing or not doing, what I should be doing and not doing? Right. Um, and so I think when there's that piece of just the academia, what does it mean to build credibility? And then two, and I think you're, you know, getting to this is, um, what does it say about your circle of who, whomever it is that you're spending time with, that you are so far removed from some of these experiences that you're relying on a book 
And when somebody musters up the courage and energy to bestow upon you the gift of letting you in, opening a window so that you have insight into what that is, to swap that away and ask for a book. Um, you know, separating that, that. Thank you for calling it a <laughs> gift. I mean, I, I think about, um, not just for me, but how many of my brothers and sisters of color, the amount of energy and emotional um, labor that it takes to share our experiences, to share feedback, um, and to have that swatted away, and then to have bookshelves, titles um, paraded around as if that's going to help you understand or change your behavior. Um, in a lot of ways, it feels like it absolves personal um, obligation to be a part of the solution. It keeps it at the sort of external um, systems level. And I say systems broadly because we're not actually disrupting the system. We're just sort of keeping at a very technical um, space where we're not actually transformation we're not engaging in transformational change. We're engaging in transactions, which is not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. What's the distinction between transactions and transformational change for you? Mm. I think about transactions more as um, an exchange of head knowledge versus um, what does it mean for transformational? I think about, you know, the combination of head hands and heart, what does it mean to invest your heart, to enlist your hands and showing up differently? Um, you know, years ago, it was part of a training and it's such a simple, simple concept of the belief cycle, right? Like our beliefs drive our behaviors, our behaviors produce results, the results reinforce our, our beliefs. And I think you and I know decades in education, we're really good at looking at results. We're even better at identifying results we don't like. Um, and sometimes we can come up with theories about what actions we think are producing those results, but as long as we stay here, we don't go to that really hard look in the mirror of like what beliefs do we hold that are driving those behaviors. If we stay here, eventually we're going to keep reproducing those same results no matter how many times we change those actions. Yeah. Um, and in my mind, that's the difference. Hmm. No, I appreciate that because it's depth of impact, right? Like, and it, and it doesn't, one thing I've been really thinking a lot about is, you know, thinking about equity work as a white person, when I think about shifting belief is just understanding that I have been brainwashed, like coming to terms and accepting like whatever that process is to come to terms with it. I feel like, you know, I've done that. A, a, it's been a long time because I feel like I've been very much in the, oh, where is a belief system where I am thinking that a person of color is less than? Where, like, I just accept that it's there. And, and so, you know, I think there, that, that in and of itself is a belief, right? And so then the, if I don't have that belief, then the assumption is I've read enough of those books, I couldn't possibly have any of those deficit beliefs. Right. Right? And so if I believe that I couldn't possibly have any of those beliefs, we're going to stay in that transactional. We're going to stay in the, this situation with this school leader in this moment was a one-off thing. It didn't have anything to do with the ongoing professional development and accountability of this leader. It didn't have anything to do with this leader setting a tone um, or being able to affect change and ongoing development of the teaching staff. It certainly um, isn't engaging the thoughts and the feelings of the students that it's impacting because your brilliant 10 year old is able to articulate just so clearly what's necessary. Like, wow, we've been working on this for a year, working so hard at building trust. And now, right? Like that is actually what should be centered, not the feelings of a white person or a couple of white people who are feeling defensive because the, it sounds like, and I'm not in it, but it just sounds to me like the core issue is that people think that they're exempt from having these deficit beliefs. If you actually just started from a place of, oh, is that another place that I did not acknowledge that I have oppressive beliefs that like, of course, that's not funny. Oh, of how could I have, right? Like that actually would have been, I can't, I don't know, but it would seem to me like more in alignment with the kinds of transformational, like 
if people were responding with just, I believe you, oh my God, I thought it was funny, but I completely see now why it wasn't funny. How could I have possibly, what do I need to shift to be more mindful? Like that's the direction of folks who are up to transformation, you know, but when we get into this defensive posture and making things individualistic as if it's about this one person, you know, I don't know if you noticed because I deleted it pretty quickly, but someone um, responded today, which I thought was really interesting on that post that I shared, which oh, no engaged on I did it. not see that. And someone just went off on me for posting it and saying, I've ruined this woman's career. And I thought, wow, how quickly we rally around um, protecting this white woman who, whose career is not harmed. It's disrupted and impacted potentially. But to your point, until we get to transformation, this is a blip. This is, this is until this district is going to say, no, we absolutely are going to have transformation with accountability in place. Um, we're going to believe parents of color. We're going to believe students of color. We're going to believe families who experience marginalization and oppression because of their variety of identities. And we're going to start from there um, and have accountability around that, that, that people just think, oh, it was just this one thing during coronavirus. But no, like actually during a pandemic where Asian Americans are being targeted and I hear you, right? Like you and your family are having to change and move the way you're being in community because of very real founded fears. What does it look like to actually center that and just you make amends and you show up differently as a school leader? Like that, the fact that yeah. that wasn't even the question. Right. It's just wild. Yeah. Yeah. And to your point, you know, when I think about, um, I genuinely told district leaders initially I was so um, beside myself that I just, I didn't even know. I literally said, I don't even know what it is that I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm asking for. I just need you to understand that this is not okay. Um, and I've been thinking about that statement. Um, one, I don't know that it's always on me to have to define what it is that I'm needing. I just need Say people that. to understand that it caused harm. Say that. But I've also been thinking about one of the most powerful conversations I think I've ever had in my life to the point where I, <laughs> To this day, I don't have an answer to the question. So it was part of a different situation where some things had gone awry and um, staff member associated with what had happened pulled me aside, checked in with me, and then asked literally the most powerful question I think anybody has ever asked. And that question was, what do you need from me and from us for us to reestablish a just relationship, just as in justice? I don't know. I've literally never been asked that question. Wow. And at the time, it was such a powerful question that all I said was, I don't know how to answer that question because I've never considered that. I've never considered that I had, that I would ever be in a position where I could name what I needed in order to be in just relationship because I've been so deeply socialized as a woman, as a person of color. It is my job to rise up and reestablish this equilibrium, if I'm real. Um, but I didn't know how to answer that question. And just being asked and invited into that conversation was enough at that time. Um, but I think about that question often um, and just think about even if that had been the question, even if, if, if no one had an answer, if I had just been asked that question, right. my son had been asked that question, um, I would be in a monumentally different place. Mm. That's so deep on so many levels <laughs> um, because it just seems like such a basic question um, if we are about equity and if we are about saying we understand injustice is ongoing, we understand that we need to center the voices and the needs of those who are most impacted, we understand that people are going to flub and make mistakes as we make efforts to create a space that has never been created and to make some space for the fact that how could you even begin to answer a question like that if that's the first time you've been asked it? Yeah, yeah. 
And I think about at the time, you know, I'm 41 now. I was 39 years old when that question was asked to me. And I think about when it took that long for anybody to even think to ask a question like that. Um, And to this day, not knowing how, if I were to put myself back in that situation again, I still don't know how I would have answered that question. Right. Answered that question. Mm. Um, and, you know, I sort of alluded to it. I think it was both the power of being asked that question and the reflection that I think that was the first time it ever dawned on me that um, I had a right to be in just relationship, that I had the space, I had um, the right to define what just relationship meant for me and another person um, because I've been so deeply. Uh, taught and and have internalized that it's not my place to define that. It is my place to understand where others are and how far I need to bend to meet expectations. Um, and so I've, I I struggle with that a lot because, like I said at the top of the call, I watch my son do the same thing and it kills me. And so I'm constantly having to um, reevaluate my day what are the ways in which I did the same thing and what are the things he's picking up? Um, good or bad COVID all eyes are on each other all day long in our house. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, it's, um, it, it's funny to say one question has um, profoundly impacted me the way that it has, but it truly has just that one question. Mm. And I, you know, I, I think, sadly, it's probably going to be a while before folks, at least patterns of leaders in systems, will be comfortable asking that question because it also gives up power, right? Um, and although, it, I even let me just acknowledge the way I framed that is problematic. It doesn't give up power, right? Because the power wasn't really appropriate from the beginning. It actually is inclusive, right? It creates a power with, not a power over. Um, But I also think it's really interesting to hear that folks who are, um, who experience oppression and are historically marginalized in school communities and in communities, that there's some cognitive dissonance, it sounds like, that happens when you're asked that question. Yeah. It almost sounds like it requires practice, right? Like the audacity to- Absolutely. What would I need for there to be a just relationship here? And so- I guess I'm finding myself wondering, and your son is doing such an amazing job modeling this, I wonder what he'd say, Um, you know, even though he's no, you know, he's no longer there and you've done some work to move him, um, which is a, you know, I would imagine is bittersweet in some ways that you have access to that, but also that that's, you know, that that's a big transition. I wonder what he'd answer and I wonder what you'd answer given your current circumstance, given the current story you were sharing today. Yeah, you know, I don't, I genuinely don't know what he would say. Um, And I say that because he constantly blows us away. So I genuinely don't know (laughs) what his answer would be. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for, for me, and I would venture to say for my, my spouse as well, because we've had lots of conversations and I, I don't want lost in this conversation that the constant rock, the constant encouragement, the constant strength when I don't feel like I have it is my partner constantly. Um, if anything, when I come to these realizations, you say, that's what I've been trying to tell you the whole time. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure that that is clear. Um, in retrospect, um, and even now, if, if a school official were to call me and say, hey, listen, we have an update. And um, I think first and foremost, at the very base level, all I want is an acknowledgement that it has caused harm. Not just to our family, sure, but it causes harm to the community um, that the district serves, not just the school, but the entire district. Um, And so I think first and foremost, just an acknowledgement of, I just need you to acknowledge that that was wrong, and I need you to acknowledge that was harmful. Maybe my bar is super low, but that in and of itself would be hugely powerful for me. (laughs) I mean, look, your bar is your bar, right? And your journey is your journey. And and my prayer is that someday things that are a bare minimum um, are actually a bare minimum, you know, but 
given that folks are immediately like, let's course correct. What books does this person need to, you know, let's, let's, you know, shuffle things around as you brilliantly said, just stay into that, you know, like action and thought place instead of really getting under the surface of what beliefs are there. I mean, I think the absence of someone acknowledging that harm has happened you know the age old conversation of intent and impact i think the fear is that that acknowledgement would demonize a white female leader and the fact that there that that actually in and of itself is whiteness right like you know saying whoa someone has done something that has caused harm i'm only willing to say that if it doesn't tear down a respected white leader you know that there that someone's even grappling with the either or of that is whiteness like what does it look like to say this is a person that for many reasons we respect this person you know is, is a leader in the community and also has caused harm like if we can begin to which is why you know like i said at the beginning of this one of the reasons i love you so much is you hold such brilliant nuanced conversation you're very much in the both and uh, all the time and that is such a necessary um, and you've taught me so much about just holding space for the multitude of experiences and still always showing up in love, you know? And I think that that's the irony here is that that's who you are. You actually showing up in love, offering to volunteer and donate, centering your child's voice in all of this, doing the introspective vulnerable work of your own transformation as a parent um, and that a system can't meet you outside of either or, right? That it had to be this, this push pull and even here in this opportunity while we're talking about whiteness for you to answer this really difficult question someone asked you is i just need to i just need some acknowledgement that harm was caused and nothing in that is this is a terrible person right like it's all the stories that people assign to acknowledging that someone has done something and the the i think for me one of the deepest things that i you know is at the end of the day i i think let's just be honest, as a white person indoctrinated into whiteness, I still have racist thoughts. I still have internalized misogynistic thoughts all the time. The difference is I'm not afraid to acknowledge them, you know, mostly to myself, but like sometimes I need to be accountable because I've been brainwashed. I'm not a bad person. And I think if this white leader could get there, if more white leaders could get to a place, I mean, not like I have it all figured out, I still have so much learning to do, but I think that to that place of both and, like I have good intentions and there are things I don't see that I can only see by honoring the experiences of people who walk the world differently than I because of skin color, because of gender, because of, right, like ethnicity. If we could just get to that place, we can hold what you model so well for us, which is the both end and the nuanced of multitudes, so much rooted in love. I really appreciate you for modeling that. Oh, thank you. It's not been easy and I feel like I don't always do it well, um, but that is what I strive to do. Um, and I do think it's important too, as a woman of color to also acknowledge, I too cause harm. Um, I too um, perpetuate those very same things. Um, and as, as hard as it is, um, lots of self-protective strategies come up when someone very kindly will reveal to me ways in which I may have caused harm or ways in which um, I have said or done something that was problematic, uh, but try really hard to model the very same I am so sorry that was, I, I didn't realize that or whatever it was behind that. And thank you for telling me. And here's what I need to do to disrupt that. Here's what I need to do to remember not to do that again. Hmm. And how do I repair any damage that has, has sort of been in my own wake, right? Like I create a wake behind me too. We all do. Um, and I think that's the part where, um, Acknowledging one's mistake doesn't make you a bad person. Um, doesn't make you an evil person. It makes us all human. Um, and now more than ever, we need to give each other grace. <laughs> we need to be generous in spirit with one another. Um, but gosh, when you back yourself into a corner and deny that nothing was wrong, it sure makes it hard to extend grace and generosity. Well, right, isn't that a vicious cycle? I mean, I think that's another way <laughs> When we talk about white supremacy characteristics, this concept of perfection, right? And, and 
what if perfection is actually standing in grace and acknowledging that there is like the idea of perfection, not that we have it all figured out, which is absurd. <laughs> and it's an impossible standard. But the idea, what if we redefined the idea of perfection as gloriously imperfect, graciously imperfect, like showing up to the human connection of, wow, when I have done something that is either out of alignment with my character, done something unknowingly because of my ignorance, what if that doesn't stay willful ignorance? What if we just embrace ignorance as an opportunity? And that is, I think, um, a really wonderful way that we can, you know, and I, I don't like to say should, because I think every time there's a should, it's an opportunity to deconstruct white supremacy and <laughs> patriarchy. It's always that opportunity, but it would be a could that you don't, that you don't have to back yourself into a corner, right? There's just an, yeah. To hear you say that would have made a world of difference for that response to have been, I am so sorry, I'm taking it down and what we need to sit down in some accountability place because absolutely, I hear you, I honor your experience. I mean, imagine more leaders in general, but <laughs> imagine, I mean, not that I, we can't imagine our current president <laughs> to do something like that, but imagine more white yeah. leaders, imagine white leaders, you know, or leaders who are operating in whiteness to just embrace that vulnerability and introspection and just be transparent about their learning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the handful of times I've seen white leaders in particular just use the simple, simple communication of, I messed up. I caused harm. Here is who I caused harm with. Here is what I understand the damage to be done. And here is what I am committed to be doing differently. Here's how I'm committed to showing up differently. And if I don't, I invite you to tell me, you know, to have leaders publicly state, I made a mistake. And if I do it again, I hope you'll tell me. Um, and two things happen in that action. One, it disrupts the idea of perfection right, like but leaders can and do make mistakes. And because a leader is publicly acknowledging that mistake, it makes it that much easier to engage in that, the future mistake conversation. Um, because it's not a matter of, I will never do it again. It's when I mess up again, and it looks slightly different than this time, because hopefully I don't replicate it verbatim. Yeah. Here's how I hope the conversation will go. Mm. Well, we can dream. I think that that's a beautiful disruption of perfection or the definition of perfection. And to hear you and from your personal experience say that that makes a difference. I just want to say we don't need a book about that. Your experience is enough. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to share your story and just the, the beauty and the complexity of all of it. And Colton continues to be my hero. <laughs> <laughs> Aww, thank you so brilliant rainbow unicorn sparkle boy <laughs> i hope i got it did i get it out of order he's all of those things <laughs> uh, yep yep um yeah i mean that nickname came from i just used to just call him rainbow unicorn boy um and a friend of mine actually suggested the book sparkle boy um and even though his reading level is above it um i got it for him and um he loves that book for so many reasons. He actually has the book jacket taped to his closet right by his bed. Um, and uh, not only does this boy love all things sparkles, but um, the parents, uh, the dad looks white, the mom looks not white. Um, and so there were lots of mirrors for him in that book that he has not seen in any other place. Um, so anyway, he loves that book so much, but that's where that nickname came from. It sort of evolved from all things rainbow unicorn to my rainbow unicorn sparkle boy. Oh, it is. It's so beautiful. And I, I love to just, even in that quick glimpse, what I heard you do, it was really brilliant was even though his reading level, right, which is steeped in academia was above that. As if there was, you know, he's beyond, not that that's what you were saying, but just, I think uh, yep. academia would have to say he's beyond that book. What I heard you name is a value that is not often in, uh, in, internalized in academia, which is that he got to see himself, right? The, that yeah. representation. And so if there are books out there that are of different levels, that's not, it's the reading level is not really the issue. It's the, the value of him getting to have his authentic identity affirmed 
and to see not only himself, but a representation of his family. And that's so valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you'll love this. He then took the title, um, recommended that his school library get it. He read it to other classes that were younger than him, um, volunteered to read it. <laughs> I mean, he just, he just went all out with the book. Oh my God. I mean, that, that's just so, so it's such a testimony to, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, that just the excellent parenting you do to create space, particularly in a world that might not create that space for him. You are carving out space for him to be his most authentic self. And I think that is the most revolutionary act of equity <laughs> and justice I could imagine because I would just be so deeply saddened that any system or society would diminish the joy that is that child. He's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't do it without uh, myself, but we definitely do it together, especially when, you know, one of us gets tired, the other one has to sort of pick it up and run. Um, but I do think the other powerful thing that I'll just say uh, quickly before we end is I am deeply grateful to have uh, a partner who identifies as white male uh, model so many of the things that um, in disrupting whiteness, disrupting himself, owning his own mistakes, owning his own learnings along the way, and to have my son have a front row seat to what is possible that is not always modeled for him outside of our house. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I'm deeply grateful to be in a partnership where that is also part of how we are raising him. Yes. Oh, what a blessing. And so necessary, right? That representation matters not only for um, folks to see themselves in their identity, but it also matters to see the types of folks who hold power and privilege be a model um, for what it can look like to disrupt it within themselves. That's setting some high standards. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was so good to see you. Thank you for making you all this too. time. Oh my goodness. I can't wait to get to hug you in person when this is over. Thank you for tuning in to Eyes on Whiteness. We appreciate you listening. And if you're able to support us, don't forget, you can find us on Patreon, Eyes on Whiteness. Every little bit helps. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other. And keep disrupting white supremacy in yourselves and each other. We got a lot of work to do. Take care, y'all. See you next time.